on the air with a new dangerous winter storm right on the heels of a brutal and deadly freeze coast to coast with a bunch of places not used to this kind of thing getting slammed. We'll take you live to Tennessee where they're seeing almost twice as much snow as they usually do all winter already. Then we'll take you to New York with former President Trump in court before the campaign trail. Why a judge threatened to kick him out and why Mr. Trump said he'd love it. Plus, the investigation into Boeing getting bigger as the feds are looking at how a door blew off that Alaska Airlines flight midair, what the government now wants the company to do. Then, in tonight's original, a closer look at the spike in fires from e-bike batteries that go haywire and what Congress could do about it. And our breakdown tonight on how the 2024 candidates plan to tackle what is the most important issue for voters, their money. A vibe check on the economy and the huge differences between President Biden's plans and his Republican rivals later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and with the country in the grip of a deadly cold, there's another storm building in what would be a dangerous and potentially devastating one-two punch. We know at least 16 people have died from the brutal freeze and the snow this week. A lot of those deaths down south. Because while this weather, of course, is a risk for everybody, some places are more used to it than others. Look at Nashville. Typically, that's a city that sees just under five inches of snow the whole year. So far this season, just this winter, it's already at nearly double that already. That's more than Boston, Philly, D.C., New York. You got a big power supplier in Tennessee asking customers to cut back because of so much demand for heat today. Same thing in Texas. And a new storm is already bringing freezing rain and ice to places out west like Oregon. You can see how slick some of the sidewalks are. Look at that. That's a layer of ice right there. In the state alone, around 75,000 people are without power. You've got several school districts shut down as that storm system now barrels across the country with more than 35 million of us under winter alerts tonight. Meteorologist Bill Karens is joining us with a forecast from Colorado in just a second. Kathy Parks is live for us in Knoxville, Tennessee. And Kathy, we were just saying, in Tennessee, it is a place not used to this kind of cold. Six people have been killed there as the storm system has moved through. Talk about what you're seeing and, and the response from the city and the state. Hey there, Hallie. Good evening to you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Here in the south, especially Tennessee, we're used to seeing snow, but just not this much snow. So we just checked with the weather unit, and over the last couple of days, we got 8.6 inches of snow. Typically, during the winter season, that number is close to 4.6 inches. So we doubled that in just a matter of days. So obviously, when we spoke with folks here on the ground, they were kind of caught off guard. They were anticipating just a couple of inches, but over the past couple of days, they, they saw the accumulation. They saw the pileup. I can tell you, Hallie, just even driving here, the roads are extremely treacherous. Uh, crews are working around the clock, but they are still playing catch up. A lot of the secondary roads are still iced over, so they're encouraging people to take it easy, try not to be on the roadways if you can, to give those crews ample space to kind of continue doing their thing. Also, uh, classes here across uh, the state of Tennessee, a lot of schools have either canceled for the rest of the week or delayed uh, for the rest of the week. A lot of workplaces have encouraged people to be remote as well. So those are some of the things that are taking place right now. But then adding insult to injury, we're dealing with the, the brutal cold. Right now we're in the 20s, but it feels like we're in the teens. And during the overnight hours, we'll probably be in the single digits. So all the snow that you're seeing right now will probably ice over. And then, of course, black ice will be an issue during the overnight hours. Well, so that's the scary part, right, is black ice overnight potentially. But then for so many people, they've got another storm system right on the heels set to bring the same kind of messy mix. Snow, maybe freezing rain. You're going to have that ice mm -hmm. issue again before they've even been able to recover from what they're already seeing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and the thing is, I think the biggest takeaway from the storm, Hallie, is try to be prepared in advance if you can, because like I said, a lot of folks uh, weren't necessarily prepared for this. A lot of the, the snow shovels, the salt and sand, by the time they were, you know, the snow got here, they didn't have that ready to go. So a lot of folks are still kind of hunkered down in their homes or kind of hoping that the weather will improve the next couple of days. But the thing is, uh, you know, tomorrow it's supposed to kind of break that freezing mark, but then there is another storm, as you mentioned, that comes right behind it but obviously you were here at this park here in knoxville it has been packed throughout the day today a lot of kids don't have school and a lot of adults actually don't have work so we we had a chance to speak with them earlier today about all the snow take a listen i don't remember it being this much snow staying this this long for 
10 years or more probably. Yeah. I wasn't expecting this much, mm -hmm. especially to see it fall down for so long, yeah. you know? So, and then the cold temperatures stay in the way they are. So Hallie, once again, officials are encouraging people to stay indoors as much as possible. Obviously, this week is going to be a tough one because there is another storm system that we are watching tomorrow night into Friday. But fortunately, the accumulation is supposed to be just about a half an inch. Hallie? Kathy Park, that's good news, at least that it's not more than that live for us there in Nashville. Kathy, thank you. I want to bring in meteorologist Bill Karens now, who has made his way out of the studio into Steamboat Springs, Colorado, where it is coming down, Bill. Talk us through it as you're out in it. What are people watching for? What should we be looking for next? Yeah, Hallie says back to my storm chasing days. I, I can't imagine yeah. a spot in the entire U.S. where it's snowing harder than this right now. We've already had about six to eight inches since sunrise this morning. The forecast here is for another one to two feet by tomorrow afternoon. There are winter storm warnings, of course, up for this area and also avalanche warnings. Yeah, they, they have levels like one, two, three, four, five. Right now we're at a four out of a five. They call that high. They only bury highs after that. So it is dangerous to be out there in the backcountry. But if you're on the slopes or ski patrols, Ben, then it's good and they call this champagne powder for a reason because it's 20 mm. degrees and it's just like that it's we don't get that on the east coast at all you know it's just like the sloppy messy stuff so yes yeah, so let me show you at the top of the mountain this is about 4,000 feet higher than what i'm located right now they call this the champagne powder cam and this will show us the storm totals from this morning right around eight inches now this time tomorrow that should be somewhere between 20 to 30 inches and this is the storm that's going to move across the country so let's take you through this this is storm number four in the last two weeks we're now up to 40 million people under either alerts or warnings and notice the south again even northern louisiana memphis again too nashville all through kentucky you're under winter weather advisories so that's the part of the country that we're going to continue to monitor this storm the rest of this week. We're watching all of the snow now. 75,000 people without power in Oregon, by the way, from this storm, mostly from all the ice problems. This storm will be moving through the Intermountain West tonight, and then tomorrow we take this storm and it redevelops in the south, and that's when we're going to have the icy mess throughout the south. And the storm finally ends on the east coast by the time we get to Friday. And the timing, Hallie, horrible once again for people with kids in school, getting home from work. The heaviest snow will be in D.C., Philly, and New York, right mm. around noon to about 5 p.m. So, uh, yeah, not like a huge blizzard or anything, but the impacts from this storm, you know, it only takes a couple inches at the wrong that's time right. of day, as we saw with the last one, for major problems. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's that layering impact there. Uh, Bill, Karens, thank you very much. Thank you for being there, getting, uh, getting snowed on today. Appreciate it. Let's take you out east, because it is from court that we are seeing former President Trump today, not the campaign trail, at least not yet, with writer E. Jean Carroll's defamation damages trial against Mr. Trump just wrapping up in the last half hour for the day. And let me tell you, there were some fireworks in court with the judge starting to get pretty fed up, it seemed, with Mr. Trump and his attorney at one point telling them, we're going to do it my way in the courtroom. You see the sketches here, no cameras in court, but you've got this trial putting Mr. Trump and E. Jean Carroll face to face as she got on the stand today to tell the jury how Mr. Trump, in her words, ended the world she'd been living in when he called her a liar. But remember, no matter how much Mr. Trump denies what Carol's saying on the stand, he's already been found liable for sexually abusing her and defaming her. This trial is just about how much money he should be paying her now as a consequence for that. All of it, of course, coming just six days away from the New Hampshire primary, where a new poll out today shows him leading by double digits now, 16%. Nikki Haley behind him there. He's taking direct aim at her, going on social media to mock her birth name. You can read it there. We're going to get to more on that in a second with Garrett Hake, who is in Manchester, New Hampshire for us. Dasha Burns is also in New Hampshire, but I want to get to Rahima Ellis first for more on this trial from New York. So what was interesting here, he wasn't on the stand. He didn't have to be in court, but he made sure to show up and make his presence known. Based on our team who was actually in the room, he was doing things like, you know, hitting his hand on the desk, making faces, sighing loudly, etc. Talk about that and the judge's response here and what it could mean as the, the next, you know, five, six, seven days of this play out. Well, it may continue to be contentious if indeed Mr. Trump continues to be in the courtroom, because uh, today it was so contentious in terms of Mr. Trump doing exactly what the judge had told him not to do. He had set out some guardrails yesterday when this trial began, and he said both to Mr. Trump's team and to E. Jean Carroll's team that they were not to make any remarks about this case that could be heard within the earshot of the jury. So what does Mr. Trump do? He does exactly that. And so the judge threatened him with these remarks. We're going to show them to you on the screen. And the judge said, Mr. Trump, I hope 
I don't have to consider excluding you from the trial. I understand you are very eager for me to do that. Mr. Trump replied, I would love it. I would love it. And then Judge Kaplan said, I know you would because you just can't control yourself in this circumstance. You just can't. And at that point, it seemed as though it didn't get any better. Uh, the two sides, in terms of not only what Mr. Trump was doing, it was mentioned in another report that Mr. Trump said, muttered it to his breath when the, the, the judge said, you can't control yourself. Uh, Trump muttered in under his breath that you can't either to the judge. And afterwards, uh, the, Trump was continuing to post on social media things about the judge. And uh, this is when it seems like uh, he can't seem to stop himself. He said on social media, I did nothing wrong except defend myself from false, malicious and defamatory accusations by somebody writing a book and deciding to put this fake nonsense into it probably for the publicity that she would get. So that's the kind of remarks that uh, Trump is making on social media. He's not so hesitant to make them in his own kind of way in the courtroom as well. And the judge is not happy with it at all, Hallie. We know that in just even the last, I think, three or four minutes, Rahima, as you and I have been talking here, the former president has now left court for the day. We know he is headed up to where Garrett Hake is posted up uh, in just a second. And Garrett, we'll get to you in a minute. But first, Rahima, just to talk through sort of the, the actual case in front of us here, where, what is your sense of where this goes now? It is expected to be a fairly quick damages trial because, as we laid out, this isn't about whether he did anything wrong. It's about how much he has to basically pay up, right, what the damages will be in this instance. Yeah, uh, as... Uh as um, E. Jean Carroll's attorney has been saying, this is about how do you punish him to a point where he will stop making these kinds of remarks. Well, the Trump team is trying to put on some uh, defense of its own, saying that E. Jean Carroll is looking for attention, that for someone who was saying that she did not want to get attention and for someone who was saying that her life ended as she knew it as a result of the remarks that came from the former president, um, pr uh, Former President Trump's attorney in the courtroom asked her, well, why did you go on television shows? And why did you uh, do interviews? And at one point, the um, attorney for E. Jean Carroll objected to these kinds of questions, and the judge sustained them, even asking her uh, at some point, did you, she said she felt unsafe by these threats. And at some point, she was asked by President Trump's uh, attorney, you said you have a gun. Yes. Uh, do you have a license? E. Jean Carroll said, no. Are you aware you need a license? At that point, the judge says, don't even start. Shortly afterward, the court ended for the day, and it's going to resume tomorrow at 9.30. Yeah. Allie? And we can see uh, Mr. Trump there. He is live, now walking out of court, obviously standing, sort of waving here. Garrett Hake, he is going to be in your neck of the woods. We're going to have a team monitor to listen to what he's saying in case there's anything newsworthy there. He's going to be in your neck of the woods, Garrett, coming up later on tonight for another rally in New Hampshire. That is where the political world's focus is right now. Um, you know, I've been out in the field the last few days. I spoke with Eric Trump. Uh, I think it was the night of the Iowa caucuses who told me, listen, they believe that the former president's legal doings, his legal issues, actually propel him in the campaign. Donald Trump didn't have to show up in court today. He didn't have to be in court last week at his civil trial. But the optics, it seems, is something that he and his team want to put front and center here. Yeah, Hallie, I think that's right. And I'll take issue with one point you made in that question here, because the way this has turned out is that the center of the political world has been wherever Donald Trump is. Look what we're doing on this Fair. broadcast. We were talking about him and his legal case long before we talk about what anyone else is doing on the campaign trail today. And so what do you have here, I think, is a three-part decision by Donald Trump. First, the fact that this case is personal to him. He has made that comment before. He said it on social media today. He wishes he had gone to the first trial. He's now going to this trial, he says, to keep an eye eye on things. Second, he has the ability to kind of focus the attention of the political press anywhere he goes, as evidenced by what we're doing right now. And third, the, the message that he has been giving, whether it's at these court appearances, whether it's in these press conferences, or here on the stump, has been pretty consistent. He believes, he says, over and over again that he is being targeted for his political beliefs and for his political positioning as Joe Biden's biggest rival. That has become uh, a point of absolute
absolute truth to many of his supporters and to some Republicans who aren't even Trump supporters who I've been talking to in Iowa and in New Hampshire who broadly see these cases against him and they often blur the lines and distinctions between them because there are so many as politically motivated and as efforts to take Donald Trump down. As long as he can draft off of that from a messaging perspective, he's just as well suited to be there as he is to be in this hotel ballroom in New Hampshire where he'll be later tonight. Well, and let's get to that messaging, Garrett. And just so people know, our team monitoring what Mr. Trump is saying, it is essentially his truth social come to life with attacks on the judge, with concern over the way that this procedure has gone forward. Um, what's, what's interesting here, Garrett, is the way that he's also going after, and he has been now for a bit, Nikki Haley, who s seems like if there's a state she's she's got to do well in or she, she could do well in, it's New Hampshire, where independence outnumber any other voting block there. Um, that, is an, that is a group that she is sort of stronger with, Garrett. He's been attacking her, yep. um, even as this new polling shows that perhaps the race may be opening up a bit in Donald Trump's favor. Talk us through some of the dynamics as you hear them on the ground. Let's talk about that poll first, because I think it's instructive of where we are in this moment. This is yeah. a new poll from our NBC affiliate here in Boston, the closest major media market, which shows Donald Trump leading in New Hampshire by 16 points today. Uh, it's a fairly, fairly significant lead. We have seen polls recently that have shown that lead much smaller, and we have seen some that show it in this sort of low double-digit ballpark. That said, mathematically, Trump's team knows there is still a possibility for Nikki Haley to win here. There were several things that had to happen for that to be the case, including Chris Christie dropping out, check. Ron DeSantis not dropping out, check. And then Nikki Haley overperforming with some of the groups you mentioned, independents and more moderate, sort of more traditional Mitt Romney-style Republicans. That remains an open question. We didn't really see it in Iowa, but we are, could potentially see it in New Hampshire. And the Trump team has taken no chances. They've been aggressive on television airwaves, both with his campaign and with his super PAC, really starting about two weeks ago, softening her up here in New Hampshire. They, Donald Trump attacked her several times from the stump last night. And even the fact that he now has Vivek Ramaswamy endorsing and appearing with him in the state, we all remember mm -hmm. from those debates, Ramaswamy was sort of like a Nikki Haley seeking missile during his debate performances. <laughs> he served some of that same function last night. And I expect we'll continue to hear more from him on that between now and Tuesday. Evocative imagery, as always. Garrett Haig, live for us there in Portsmouth. Thank you. In Hampton is our friend and colleague, Dasha Burns, who's following, of course, the other candidates in this race, not just Nikki Haley. Hey, Ron DeSantis is still in, although today we found out he is essentially putting New Hampshire uh, behind him in the rearview mirror before this primary even starts. He's going to shift his focus to South Carolina. Why? Yeah, Allie, real quick, I'll just correct you there. I was in Hampton earlier. Oh. We've been driving across the state, Sorry. made my way back okay. to I should never Manchester say cities. here. Thank All you. good. <laughs> All good. I've, I've been on the road. <laughs> Hard to keep up. Um, but listen, yeah, th so here's what this is going to look like. He did do two stops in New Hampshire today. He's going to then go back to Tallahassee for, for a little bit and then reemerge this weekend in South Carolina. And look, we know New Hampshire is not uh, fertile ground for DeSantis. He knows that. We know that. We've seen the polling numbers. This is much more of uh, Nikki Haley's uh, turf where she's doing better here with moderates, independents. Those are not the voters that DeSantis is trying to court, right? South Carolina is really where he's looking. That's where he feels like it's going to be tough for Haley. He feels like South Carolina is where he can turn this thing into an actual two-person race. And they're looking at this timeline, Hallie, between the uh, New Hampshire primary and the South Carolina primary, a whole month where they're going to be able to move their staff there. They're doing that right now. They're moving the majority of their campaign staff to South Carolina. They're going to be doing what they did basically in Iowa and trying to rally support for him there and seeing what happens, seeing if they can do what they did and punch their ticket out of South Carolina like they did in Iowa and stay in it for the long haul. The question is resources. Dasha Burns live for us there in Manchester, New Hampshire. Dasha, I know it's going to be another busy few days, few weeks for you. Appreciate it. Let's bring you back here to Washington where President Biden is just wrapping up a key meeting with some of the top leaders on Capitol Hill. What does he want? He wants money. He wants more money for Ukraine, for Israel, for border security, according to what multiple sources are telling NBC News. Why does this matter? Right? What is the timing situation here? Well, there it is, 11.59 p.m. Friday. So just about 48 hours from now to try to get to some kind of a short-term deal before there's a partial government shutdown, right? That kind of money runs out Friday night. 
don't panic. We're going to talk through what that actually means with Peter Alexander, who is posted up at the White House. Sometimes when we talk shutdown, it's like sky is falling, right? Not the situation here, but it is significant. It is indicative of where the president's head's at and how he is working to try to negotiate something with these leaders on the Hill. Talk us through it. Yeah, that's right. We have, we have two issues here, right? You have the government shutdown on one hand. On the other hand, you have the issue of Ukraine, Israel, and border security. We start with that risk of a shutdown, which would happen at the end of this week. And it feels like deja vu all over again here, Hallie. But this time, unlike those in the past, there isn't that same sense of urgency or perhaps concern that we're facing a government shutdown. Really, that's something you just get from your conversations with lawmakers and with those here at the White House right now. The Senate just last night uh, passed what sort of the vehicle, the way to get this thing moving toward avoiding a shutdown at the end of this week. Nonetheless, if that is to happen, if they do pass what they describe as a CR, a continuing resolution, this would be the third time <laughs> since September that they didn't come up with a year-long agreement on how to fund the government. They are doing it just one short step after another. So there's still a long distance to go, but the likelihood of a shutdown this time around appears to be off the table if they can continue at this pace, kicking the can down to March before they may have to revisit it again, Hallie. So because our show, the, one of the models of our show is no lingo, right? CR, continuing resolution, that's the point you're making, right? The kicking of the can down the road. Nobody really wants to do it, but it seems like that is going to be the solve here. Talk us through the interplay between what you're hearing on sort of the border security issue, the money. For, there's a lot going on here. How are people supposed to think about it and why should they care? Well, I think you should care specifically as it relates to the meeting that just wrapped up here a few minutes ago, an hour and 20 minutes. They were behind closed doors. President Biden, the Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson and about two dozen others, Democrats and Republicans, White House aides gathering to focus on any deal that would package up in one big bow spending to help support Ukraine, yep. Israel and to help fund stricter policies at the U.S.'s southern border right now. Republicans have made very clear, House Republicans in particular, that they want strict new policies there. We heard from the Speaker, Mike Johnson, as he left the meeting, say that he still stands by his call for those hardline policies, but he's open to some concessions as long as they are meaningful. There is still some tough border policies that come uh, in this process, but he says there isn't going to be any real conversation about Ukraine, and he says the status quo mm. in Ukraine isn't significant or isn't going to move the dial until they really get the issue of border security uh, fixed. We should say, though, the, Senate, the Senate's top Democrat, Chuck Schumer, Halley said he feels more optimistic than he's been about this issue in quite some time. The Senate, including Republicans, making some real agreements. The question is, will those House Republicans be on board? There's a lot at stake here as we watch to see where this goes in the days ahead. Can I just ask you, Peter, do we have any sense of what the dynamic is like between President Biden and the House Speaker? They weren't really pals before Mike Johnson got the gavel. Yeah. What's it been like since he's taken it? It's a good question. We haven't been behind closed doors for those meetings. This one, press was not even invited uh, inside for any period of time. This is the first meeting between President Biden and congressional leaders in months. Speaker Mike yeah. Johnson and President Biden haven't been together since October. Biden, of course, is someone who's a veteran of these negotiations, having done it during his time in the, uh, in the Senate and as vice president for decades. Speaker Mike Johnson, a lot newer to this process. So it is a dynamic that I think has a lot of people in Washington watching very closely, including you, Peter. Thank you. Great to see you. We've got a lot more to get to here on the show, including the Princess of Wales in the hospital tonight. She is not the only royal taking a break from public events because of health reasons. It is a story that the world is talking about. Some new details around what's happening there with her recovery and her father-in-law's, the king, next. Plus, more younger Americans are getting colon cancer. Why? Not even doctors know for sure. We're getting into it. Tonight, the Princess of Wales is in the hospital, recovering from what Kensington Palace says was a successful abdominal surgery. Excuse me, abdominal surgery. That's all we know. Abdominal surgery. That's really all they're saying about this. Other than she's going to be taking a break, kind of laying low, taking it easy for the next couple of months. That's after she'll be in the hospital for an estimated two weeks. So maybe 13 more days from today. No reason why. That's it. That's really all they said is the princess has asked for privacy. News of her hospitalization, news that rocketed around the world today, came just before we learned that her father-in-law, King Charles III, is having a procedure next week to treat an enlarged prostate. Megan Fitzgerald is joining us now. 
A lot coming out of the royal family here related to health issues, related to hospitalizations. Let's start here with, with what's happening with Princess Kate, of course, uh, who's, who's married to Prince William. Long road to recovery, it sounds like. Two weeks in the hospital, a couple of months of laying low, taking it easy after that. Do we have any insight as to what the medical concern is here? We know that she's asked for privacy, obviously. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And look, Kensington Palace is not releasing much detail, but you're absolutely right to, to ask that question because, I mean, given the length of recovery, it certainly makes it seem as though uh, this was a significant surgery that she underwent yesterday. Now, of course, Kensington Palace saying that this was a planned procedure, a planned operation, uh, and that it was non-cancerous uh, and that it was successful. So certainly some good news there, but it, it certainly doesn't negate the fact that she's going to be spending at least the next uh, two weeks behind me in the hospital here recovering. Once she is released, she will then continue recuperating at home uh, for at least the next several months. I mean, medical officials are advising, according to Kensington Palace, uh, that the Princess of Wales doesn't get back to work. No public appearances until after Easter. So that's, you know, a, a pretty long way away. Uh, and then also keep in mind the fact that she's not done any public appearances since the beginning of this year. The last time we saw her, Hallie, uh, was on Christmas. Then there's King Charles, and this news coming out the same day, right, the same evening there where you are also set to take a break while he recovers from this procedure here. What do we know about that and anything on the timing of these announcements, both coming on the same day? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, so what Buckingham Palace has told us earlier today is that uh, King Charles is going to be going for treatment for an enlarged prostate next week. Uh, we know that this his condition is benign. Uh, they also say that the recuperation is going to be a short time. So no more details than that. Um, but they also are, are saying that the reason why the king wanted to be so detailed, descriptive, and, and go so public with this, uh, he's trying to send a message here. He wants uh, men all across the world uh, to sort of Take a look at themselves. If you if you feel something, uh, if something just doesn't seem right, to go and get it checked. He's trying to send that message. But then rightfully, as you pointed out, Hallie, I mean, look, this is not typically what we see coming from Buckingham Palace. We don't see this level of transparency, if you will. Right. Um, they're, they're not as public. They're very private about their condition, certainly as it relates to health. This is what we saw with the Queen. We've talked to royal experts about this, and they say, look, likely lessons learned from the past, this idea that, you know, the more transparent you are, you're controlling the message, you're releasing factual information, it sort of limits or at least pushes away um, the amount of rumors that could swirl, Hallie. Megan Fitzgerald, live first there in London, likely to be a, a busy few weeks for you all over there. Thank you so much. Let's get you over to the five things, our team things you should know about tonight. Number one, a man accused of faking his death and leaving the U.S. to avoid rape charges is denying he's actually the suspect. Nicholas Rossi was charged in connection to a 2008 rape, but in court yesterday, claims he's actually Arthur Knight Brown. Prosecutors say he's used at least 10 different names over the years, different aliases, and that they didn't ID him as a suspect until now because of a backlog of DNA test kits. He's now behind bars without the possibility of posting bail. There's a detention hearing next week. Number two, a new study from the American Cancer Society says colorectal cancer is now the deadliest cancer for men under the age of 50. It is the second deadliest among women in the same age group behind breast cancer. Doctors aren't sure why colorectal cancer is becoming more common, but they say perhaps things like sedentary behavior, people aren't as active, people aren't eating as well, that could be playing a role. Number three, the White House is out with a new plan to try to cut down on overdraft fees. So basically, if your bank account balance goes below zero, the cost to overdraw beyond that could go down to $3. Right now, those fees can be up to $30 or more. It's part of the administration's push to try to get rid of so-called junk fees. Number four, the New England Patriots, excuse me, the Patriots are formally introducing Jared Mayo as their new head coach today. Youngest head coach in the NFL. He's 37. That is amazing for a 37 year old he's also the first black head coach in patriots history number five guess who's making a comeback at coachella this year no doubt because no doubt y2k is back you know this group gwen stefani formed it in 19 uh, they split up in 2015. we know that they had huge hits i mean this is like millennial core right here super nostalgia for coachella for no doubt making a big comeback we'll see what's the other be performing Let's take you to Ohio now where some newly released body cam video shows the dramatic moment when police set off a flashbang grenade during a raid in Ohio. The person inside says police were at the wrong house. We're going to show you this video, but we've got to warn you, it may be disturbing. Oh my God! 
You hear glass shattering. You hear a woman screaming as police force their way through the door. The woman says her baby is there, a baby who has a pre-existing condition and is on a ventilator. That 17-month-old was hospitalized the following day with the mom blaming police negligence. The mayor has ordered an investigation. Valerie Castro is joining us now. And Valerie, we have some conflicting reports here, particularly surrounding the care of the baby. Mm -hmm. What do we know about what happened and what are police saying? So, Hallie, from the get-go, Courtney Price, who is the mother of the baby, she is telling police, look, my baby is on a ventilator inside this home. There is body camera footage later on after she's brought out of the house in handcuffs, again telling police that her child is inside the home and on a ventilator. Later, body camera footage again shows everyone inside the home. They are now looking at this baby, assessing the baby, including the mom, and police released a statement saying that detectives, paramedics, and mom were inside the home. They confirmed that the child did not sustain any apparent visible injuries. Now, mom says she was still worried. They went to the hospital, and then the hospital released them. But the next day, she says her baby's not breathing. She calls 911. Again, they go to a hospital. That's when her child is transported to a children's hospital. And she says doctors there tell her that her son is suffering from inflammation to his lungs and irritation around his eyes that they believe could be caused by some sort of chemical reaction. Now, police issued a statement saying that they did use those flashbangs when they entered entered the home. They say those were only sound and light. They say there was no chemical component to those flashbangs. So in another portion of the statement, they say any allegations suggesting the child was exposed to chemical agents, lack of medical attention, or negligence is not true. But Hallie, Courtney Price uh, doesn't seem to think that's the case. Do we know why police were even at this house in the first place? So the city of Elyria released some police reports and some documents after this all happened. And police say this was an investigation around some stolen firearms. They had a search warrant. They were looking for someone. And that is why they were at that particular home. Price says the person that they were looking for, she got a look at the search warrants. She says the person they were looking for hasn't lived there in more than a year. She says now her aunt and uncle live there. She just moved there last week to stay with them while her baby waits uh, for heart surgery. Again, he's a preemie. And she says uh, he needs that surgery. So that's why she was there in the first place. But as far as she knows, the suspect hasn't been there in quite some time. Valerie Castro, thank you very much. When we come back, the U.S. redesignated the Houthis as a global terrorist organization tonight. When that label will go into effect and what comes with it is we have some more breaking news from the region. We're just getting it in. We're going to bring it to you in just a second. Plus, a stunning rescue in Florida. How Hulk Hogan used a pen to get somebody out of a trapped car. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. Here's what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, the Golden State Warriors are postponing tonight's game against the Utah Jazz after assistant coach Dejan Milojevic died after a heart attack at a team dinner. He's a Serbian basketball legend. He's coached in the States since 2021. In a statement, the team's head coach called Milojevic a relentlessly upbeat person who brought joy to others every day. He was just 46 years old. Out of our Northeast Bureau, a judge is denying a request to dismiss the case against a Marine who put a man in a deadly chokehold in a New York City subway last year. Remember this, Daniel Penny is now pleading not guilty to two charges in the death of Jordan Neely. After Penny pinned Neely to the ground and put him in a chokehold for three minutes, the whole thing caught on camera. Penny's trial is set to start this fall. And that of our Southern Bureau wrestling legend Hulk Hogan helped a trapped teenager after her car flipped on a Florida highway. He says he used a ballpoint pen to cut a hole in the car's airbag and then get her out. Police say there were only minor injuries from the crash. Just wow. Posted, uh, Hulk Hogan posted on social media later saying, thank you, God, all is well, even now. Incredible. Listen, we've got some breaking news coming into us here. A U.S. ship hit by a drone strike in the Gulf of Aden today. The latest attack in the Middle East region with Yemeni armed forces claiming responsibility. This comes right after the U.S. declared the Yemen-based Houthis a terror organization. Its latest move to try to stop all the Houthis' drone and missile attacks on U.S. military ships and on commercial vessels, commercial ships, in the Red Sea. 
the Houthis not backing down, saying they will keep fighting, with the top leader telling the U.S. in a new statement, in his words, the ball is in your court and you can call us whatever you want. Remember, the U.S. and allies have also been hitting the Houthis with strikes in Yemen over all this. And that new terror label that will take effect in 30 days brings financial sanctions and penalties to the Houthis. The White House says they're designing these sanctions to try to limit how much this could harm people in Yemen, who are among the world's poorest and hungriest. Elsewhere in the region, the war, of course, between Israel and Hamas ongoing, with inside Gaza much-needed medicine set to be delivered to hostages in exchange for more humanitarian aid. Richard Engel has more from Jerusalem. The crisis in the Red Sea continues to escalate. A short while ago, the Houthi militia, which controls large parts of Yemen, which has already been targeted by the U.S. military on at least three occasions, said that it carried out another attack on an American vessel. No confirmation of that strike. Uh, in the statement from the Yemeni military, that's how the Houthis describe themselves, they said that they fully expect there to be another American retaliation, but that they will not be deterred. Uh, they have already been designated just today as an official terrorist organization. And that comes with consequences, making it more difficult for international humanitarian organizations to operate inside Yemen, making it uh, more difficult for uh, Houthi uh, officials to travel, engage in any kind of international finance. Uh, earlier, I spoke with one of the very top Houthi leaders, and he said that despite the terrorist uh, designation, they had been on the U.S. terrorist list, then taken off of it, and now put back onto it again. Uh, they said that they will continue to carry out attacks in the Red Sea. They said that they are targeting vessels that are bound for Israel or assisting Israel. Israel in its war against Hamas in Gaza, but that other ships uh, are free to transit through the Red Sea and will not be targeted at all. That is something that is disputed by the Biden administration. Uh, in the war, uh, ongoing war between Israel and Hamas that has left uh, so much destruction and created so much suffering for the, for the people of Gaza, a deal has been reached and is now in the early stages of being implemented between Israel and Hamas, brokered by Qatar, uh, involving France to get medicines to the hostages. There are at least, uh, Israel believes, 100 hostages still alive in Gaza held by Hamas and, and other militant groups. And when these hostages were kidnapped, some of them were injured, some of them are elderly. Uh, by now, they are, many badly need medication. So the Israeli government provided the intermediaries detailed lists of the uh, medications that they require. The medications came from Fla France, flown to Egypt. They're being inspected. Uh, now uh, and will be transferred from an Israeli uh, crossing point into Gaza. Um, for every single box of, of medicine going to the hostages, according to the deal, 1,000 are to be delivered to the Palestinian people. The inspections are, are underway. It is a slow process, and it is, and it is hoped to be in full swing uh, by tomorrow morning local time. Our thanks to Richard Engel for that reporting. we got a lot more to get to coming up, including some new moves from the FAA tonight after that scary explosion, that scary door blowout, basically, in midair, how the agency is now expanding its investigation into Boeing. Plus, e-bike battery fires. We are seeing more of them across the country, with officials warning that number may not go down anytime soon. The FAA is announcing today it's finished the first 40 inspections of those 737 MAX 9 planes. They're looking at the data, then they're going to look at the rest of the fleet. Remember, MAX 9s are grounded. They are not flying right now because of that, that gaping hole in the middle of that Alaska Airlines flight. Remember that about a week and a half ago? That's because that door plug you see on the ground blew out of the plane. It basically popped out of the plane's body, fell down to the ground. That's why all 737 MAX 9 planes are grounded in this country. Now, the FAA says today they're paying special attention to the subcontractor that makes and installs these so-called plug doors, just as we're learning exactly where that part was made. Officials aren't saying when they think the MAX 9s are going to be ready to fly again. I want to bring in Tom Costello. Now, this obviously affects United. This obviously affects Alaska, which fly those MAX 9 planes. Yep. Um, talk about the timeline to try to get those planes back in the air. Do we have any idea? There is no timeline right now. I think the answer is when they are ready to fly, when the FAA feels they're ready to fly, and the MAX 9 it remains grounded, 
And the FAA is upset at Boeing and is not in any rush to do Boeing any favors mm. whatsoever. The FAA feels duped, if you will. They feel like they've given uh, Boeing plenty of opportunities to clean up their act since the Max 8 crashes that killed so many people. Then we've had this very serious incident. It could have been fatal, and there's not a lot of goodwill. Let me also draw your attention to what the airlines, the uh, Alaska Airlines CEO said today, because they also have been very concerned about safety. They're put, this is astonishing, Alaska is putting their own inspectors into the Boeing plant to double check Boeing's work wow. because they don't believe Boeing anymore. I mean, that's astonishing. That's with the FAA doing the same thing. So here's the CEO of Alaska Airlines today talking to passengers. Since Alaska Airlines and the FAA have grounded these aircraft, that means we are canceling between 110 to 150 flights every day. We will return these aircraft to service only when all findings have been fully resolved and meet the stringent standards of Boeing, the FAA, and Alaska Airlines. Bottom line is that's costing these airlines money, right? If you can't fly the planes that you buy to carry passengers uh, these planes are sitting empty. They've got to cancel flights. This is impacting them as well. So you now have got Boeing under pressure from a lot of different fronts, from the government, from its customers here. What do they say? Uh, first of all, this is the, I would call this the most serious reputational harm that's been done to Boeing maybe ever. I mean, wow. it, I think it's even more than the Max 8 because it's on top of the Max 8, right? After they promised they'd do better. And, oh, by the way, there's Spirit Aerosystems, which actually designs the, the fuselage. That's correct. Yeah. They are the ones who produce the fuselage with that door plug. And the NTSB chief told me today, in fact, that was made in Malaysia by Spirit Aerosystems, a subsidiary in Malaysia. All right, so Boeing CEO went to Spirit today in Wichita to talk to the entire workforce. And here's what he said. Let me just draw your attention to the last three sentences there. He says that we're essentially in every way we are going to learn from it, the event. And then it's, he says we're going to apply it to literally everything else we do. Make no mistake about it. He is trying to send a message to the Spirit team. We are all one team. But you guys messed up in a big way. You've damaged your credibility. You've damaged our credibility. We've got the FAA on us like a ton of bricks. We've got Congress. We've got the media, NBC News all over this story. you got lawsuits. This is exactly what they did not need, and it is very serious. Do you see a broader domino effect in the supply chain at all because of this? Well, I think that there are serious questions, and these have been raised for a long time, by the way, in the Wall Street Journal, the Seattle Times, the New York Times, about the supply chain that Boeing has turned to. They want to streamline everything, cut costs. They often turn to the cheapest supplier they can to cut costs. Uh, and whether this has been a, a, a good tactic. Listen, Spirit has had many problems over the years. They've drilled a whole bunch of holes in the fuselage that were un, you know, not even needed. So the pressure now was on Spirit, and then ultimately Boeing's responsible. This is a Boeing product. Tom Costello, we're so glad to have you on top of the story. And we are so glad, by the way, thank you for the last couple of days. As I've been in the field, we love seeing you here on the show. Oh, are you kidding me? Thank this was for... nice and warm and cozy. I, Did I you was, get your coffee yet? I was very jealous. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Tom Costello, appreciate you. This is tonight's original now with some in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And listen, you've probably seen some videos like this one, right? E-bike batteries bursting into flames. The aftermath here, you see... Some of those fires have been deadly, and officials say they're now going to try to do something about it. They've been trying, but this week, you've got people from all across the country here in Washington to push for more regulations on e-bike batteries. They've seen more of these fires, more than 260 in New York City last year alone, according to fire officials. Jake Ward takes a closer look. In New York City's Chinatown, a raging fire killing four people. I step out, I see the e-bike store. It's on fire. The cause? Lithium-ion batteries used to power e-bikes, setting this building, housing a bike shop, on fire, according to the New York City Fire Department. The sheer volume of fire is incredibly dangerous. Months later, e-bike batteries igniting another fire in a Bronx apartment, killing a 93-year-old woman and hurting nine others. Fire officials say they found an e-bike near the door. And this month, New York's fire department releasing this video, saying it took just 2.5 minutes for a fire from an exploding battery to consume another e-bike shop. It's a rising issue in New York City, where some 65,000 e-bikes zoom through the streets, the transportation of choice for many delivery workers. Firefighters responding to 267 e-bike battery fires last year, up from just 30 in 2019. 
and deaths from e-bike fires tripled from 6 in 2022 to 18 in 2023, according to FDNY data. And it's not just a New York problem. Fires from California to Florida, alarming officials and sparking regulations. A U.S. electronic safety company says those e-bike fires are probably a result of cheaply made batteries that might not comply with U.S. standards. These app companies have caused the demand for deliveries and particularly fast deliveries to go up along with, you know, a very cheap supply of these from overseas that are not manufactured appropriately or safely. The FDNY commissioner spoke to us from Washington, D.C., where she is pushing lawmakers to join New York City in banning uncertified lithium-ion batteries. So if these batteries can't get here, they really can't be sold within the city or the state. So we want to see the federal government uh, you know, mimic what we did in New York City. The city is also looking for other solutions like fast charging bike docks, battery swapping and an e-bike trade in program. But advocates for delivery workers say it is just the beginning of what's needed to make e-bikes and the people riding them safer. What we want to see is all the state and the federal government to step up to think about how we can expand these type of programs for other New Yorkers. Jake Ward is joining us now. Jake, we're so glad to see you. And I have to sort of disclose here, I, as an avid e-biker myself, I'm super interested in this. And I think a lot of people are. We've seen e-bikes, as you point out, explode in popularity. But it's not just the bikes. These batteries are in, you know, like a lot of things, right? That's absolutely correct. You know, and Hallie, what we're looking at is a technology that is in many cases far out in front of the solutions that we need to put fires out when they take place. We've seen this in, you know, Tesla vehicles and other electric vehicles mm -hmm. where once they catch fire, you know, in some European cities, they've had to deploy special tractor trailers filled with a special fluid, basically lift the burning vehicle into the air and drop it into this. The amount of water you have to put on one of these things when they catch fire is incredible. And that's true even down to the scale of something like an e-bike. Now, the e-bike that you own, Hallie, and that presumably those watching would own, you know, fall under the kind of regulations that we would expect. They meet a certain certification, all of that. The problem here, and this is something that both Grubhub, Uber, DoorDash all say they're working on, is this idea that we need to make a law that makes it possible that people get paid enough to actually own the right kind of e-bike the way you and I do, and that laws are passed to, to ban the flow of uncertified batteries into the country, mm -hmm. Hallie. Jake Ward, thank you so much for bringing us tonight's original. Appreciate it. Still to come here on the show, how each of the 2024 candidates says they plan to handle the economy, the biggest issue that matters to people, their money, right, with a new warning now from the head of the nation's biggest bank. A little bit of a yellow flag today on the economy from one of the world's most powerful bankers, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase. He's telling our friends over at CNBC that he still feels cautious, cautious, that's his word, about the state of the economy. Here's why. He cites Russia's war in Ukraine, unrest across the Middle East. We talked about that earlier in the show. And then some question marks over what the Fed may do on inflation and interest rates. All of it coming together in an election year where Americans are split along party lines about whether the um, economy or democracy is a bigger issue for the next president. Here's what we do know, however, that despite the numbers, whatever the numbers say, the vibes, people are not vibing with where the economy is. Another new poll shows half of Americans already think that we are in a recession or a depression here, right? 46 percent, nearly half there. The country is not actually in a recession or a depression at the moment. Christine Romans joins us now. But, Christine, people kind of feel that way, right? This is one of the big challenges for President Biden heading into November here. Yeah. He's going to face a Republican candidate who's going to be framing the economy in a very different way from President Biden here, right? Walk us through what the vision is from some of these Republicans and from the president himself. Sure. And let's just be, be very clear here. The U.S. economy is not in a recession, That's nowhere right. near it. But there is a vibe session, as you point out. People just are not feeling it. So that's where we start this campaign season. And you have Joe Biden, who has embraced Bidenomics, of course. Uh, look, he wants to maintain the Federal Reserve's independence. He wants to keep some of those tax cuts from 2017, um, from the, the Trump tax cuts, but he wants to raise taxes on, on rich people and some companies. And he says he will not touch uh, Social Security. And that, I think, is going to be the third rail of American politics. I think mm. you're going to be hearing an awful lot more about that uh, in the weeks and months ahead. 
Well, you know, it's interesting. I was just speaking with a, a, a voter. She is in her 80s in New Hampshire. She's a longtime Republican, but she was, let me tell you, Social Security, huge issue for yeah, yeah. her. That was a big one. Um, are there, go, go through some of the Republicans, sure. Christine, if you can, of where so, they stand. Donald Trump also says he will not touch um, Social Security. He even stepped forward when there were some arguments in Congress recently where do not touch Social Security. So that's off the table for him and, and, and the party that he wants to lead here. On taxes, he wants more tax cuts like he had in 2017. And he won't say it, but he has pressured the Fed as president in the past. So you could see the Fed, which is an independent agency, of course, uh, coming into, you know, uh, under pressure from him if he were president again. Nikki Haley, she also says she would pressure the, the, the Federal Reserve. She wants it to focus more on the stability of the dollar. She wants more tax cuts. And she is suggested she eliminates, she would like to eliminate the salt, that state and local tax deduction completely. She says it favors the rich. And on Social Security, she's a little more thoughtful than some of those candidates who say they would do nothing. Thing. She has uh, floated raising the retirement age for very young people. At some point, you know, the, just the numbers don't work out. And this right. is where Ron DeSantis is, right? Putting pressure on the Federal Reserve, I think you can expect that. Um, he wants to abolish the IRS completely and have a flat tax. Uh, and when he was running for Congress, he said that he would privatize Social Security and raise the retirement age, although he's not saying that today. When do you think, Christine, as you, and thank you for that, because that's a super clear sort of look at some of the big issues for people uh, economy-wise. Let's go back to the vibe session thing. Right. When might the vibes match the numbers? Like, what's, what's the sense of things? Because unemployment is low, inflation yep. is slowing down, wages are up. Like, what's, what's, what, is the, what is the disconnect? So it's starting to happen now. We had a University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index that um, was, was improving, quite frankly. You had retail sales this week that were strong, so people are still spending. So one after another, we're starting to see that loosen up just a little bit as inflation has come down from its record highs. So that Michigan number, you can see improving there. And then mm. overall, it really depends, too, on what your politics are. Republicans under a Democratic president tend to feel a lot worse about things than Democrats do at the moment. So there's also a partisanship thing that you can see happening here uh, based on who's in office. Christine Romans, thank you so much. Great I really to see appreciate you. you being on for the breakdown tonight. Good to see you, too. <laughs> that does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with a new dangerous winter storm right on the heels of a brutal and deadly freeze coast to coast with a bunch of places not used to this kind of thing getting slammed. We'll take you live to Tennessee where they're already seeing almost twice as much snow by now as they typically do all winter. Then we'll take you to New York with former President Trump in just the last hour talking about his pretty contentious day in court. Uh, he says the judge, what he says about the judge and why the judge seems to be also telling Mr. Trump, you might be kicked out. Plus, here in Washington, President Biden and congressional leaders have two days left to stop a government shutdown. Some of the details we're getting in just the last hour, plus where border talks stand moving forward. And the shocking new body cam footage our team is getting of a police raid in Ohio that led to a baby in the hospital. A lot of questions and conflicting reports on this story. We'll explain why the mayor wants a new investigation tonight. And Princess Kate, set to be in the hospital. She's there tonight, maybe for 10, 14 more days. Few details on the procedure that could keep her away from her royal duties for months. We're live from London later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And with the country in the grip of a deadly cold, another storm is building in what could be a dangerous and potentially devastating one-two punch. We know at least 16 people have died from the brutal freeze and the snow this week. A lot of those deaths down south. Because even though this kind of weather is a risk for everybody, there are some places that are more used to it than others. Nashville, not used to it. Typically, it gets just under five inches of snow for the whole year. So far this winter season, it's nearly double that already. More than Boston, Philly, D.C., New York. A big power supplier in Tennessee wants customers to cut back tonight because of so much demand for heat right now. Same deal down in Texas, as you've got a new storm already bringing freezing rain and ice to places like Oregon. You can see how slick some of the sidewalks are. Look at that, that layer of ice there. In Oregon, about 75,000 people are already without power. Some school districts are shutting down as that system barrels across the country with more than 35 million of us under winter alerts tonight. We've got Kathy Park live for us in Knoxville, Tennessee. But first, I want to get to meteorologist Bill Karens, who's joining us from Steamboat Springs, Colorado. The snow is coming down and down and down. Talk us through what you're seeing and the expectations, Bill. 
Yeah, so this is storm four in two weeks. I mean, this has been an incredible stretch of winter. I mean, remember December? Everyone was like, where's winter? And all of a sudden, it's just like, bam, smacking us in the face. Here in Steamboat, we've had 75 inches of snow since January 5th. We've had eight inches alone already today. And what we call, like, moderate to heavy snow. So you see the gondola behind me here. And often, when you notice in the distance, the poles kind of disappear. That's about a quarter mile to about a half mile visibility. That's what we'd call moderate to heavy snow. That's when you're getting about one inch per hour accumulations. And that's when it gets a little difficult for people to keep up to it on the roads, especially the road crews in many areas. And this is the storm that's hitting here now that knocked out that 75,000 people without power in Oregon because of the ice storm. There's about 12,000 people in Washington state because of the ice also. And that storm is now going to travel across the country. So let's track that and let's kind of let you know who is going to be at risk. Yeah, I know you said 35 million alerts. Hallie, we just added another 5 million. We keep getting higher totals because this storm as it moves east. Anything in the white there is winter weather alerts. That's not a warning. That's an alert. That means you have winter weather heading your way. But when you see it's in Louisiana, Memphis again, Nashville, all of Tennessee, a good chunk of Kentucky is going to get snow out of this. This is going to be slick for your Thursday night. And then finally, this will get to the east coast on Friday. So the storm now, it's come through the northwest. It's going to come through the Rockies night. Where I'm standing right now is going to get another one to two feet of snow as we go through the night. Great for everyone like me that's skiing here this week. But for people trying to get here, it's going to be very difficult. And the avalanche concerns are also a problem, not just in this region, but, you know, we saw what happened two weeks ago there in uh, Tahoe. So when we get these big storms one after another, we get the different layers of consistency with the snow. Uh, make sure you're skiing inbounds. So as the storm goes across the country, we'll see Thursday night breaking out. That's the snow and icy mess throughout the south. And then on Friday, this makes it to the east coast. It's not a huge event. It's kind of like the last storm, only about one to three inches. Maybe someone will get four to five, but it's going to happen during the day. It's going to be starting during the morning rush hour. It'll continue and then be ending for the evening rush hour. So Hallie, one to three inches. It's been plenty cold. The ground is frozen. It's going to stick. And that means treacherous sidewalks for all the kids coming home from school and all the parents, right. too. Let me just acknowledge, too, because you're standing you're in front of the gondola there at Steamboat. I've never uh, been there to, yep. to ski. Amazing for skiers, obviously, right? Like, they want to see the powder coming down. <laughs> yes. But there's, and while it's fun for, like, the right occasion, as you point out, the right time, when you have the right gear at the right moment with the snow, the, the real concern, as you're pointing out here, Bill, is timing if you're not ready for it, especially when it's coming right behind this other system that has just crippled such huge parts of this country. Yeah, one storm after another. And when you get places like this in the mountains and the Rockies, people in the east don't even know about this. I didn't even know about this until I got here. Is you have to be careful what we call tree wells. So you get so much snow, feet of snow, but it doesn't accumulate underneath the evergreens because it sits on top of them. So you get these holes down by the base of the trees, and skiers can fall in those. So that's why I'm out here with my son. And, you know, one rule number one, you never go by yourself. You never go in the woods by yourself. You want to be safe. Uh, unfortunately, there's tragedies every year, through, you know, during the ski season it's a dangerous sport uh but you have to be careful uh, a lot of snow can be very dangerous bill karens thank you very much i appreciate you being out there in the elements for us tonight kathy park is live for us in knoxville tennessee and kathy talk about what you have seen here with the the low temperatures for so long in a place like the state of tennessee which yeah they see some snow not this much not typically mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I do want to point out something because I know we just saw Bill at an actual ski resort right now here in Knoxville. This is a park, a popular park in Knoxville, and it's kind of looking like a ski resort right now because here in Knoxville, we got about eight inches in just uh, a matter of days. But yeah, Hallie, you know, the, the conditions, I, I have to say, are pretty treacherous right now. Even driving to this location, a lot of the secondary roads, the neighborhood roads are still very icy. Um, and then on top of that, we are dealing with some bone chilling temperatures. That last check, we're in the teens and overnight we'll be dropping into the single digits. But of course, this weather has taken a deadly turn across the state of Tennessee. Six confirmed fatalities so far. We're still getting the details as to what led to those deaths, but we do know that those deaths were swarm related. One individual, one man was on his roof, just clearing off the roof um, that was covered in snow. He fell and died, but those are the things that we are seeing and officials are encouraging people to stay off the roadways. If possible, crews obviously are working around the clock to kind of clear up the roadways, but obviously still a lot of work ahead. Mm -hmm. The other piece of it, too, we talked about this with Bill, it is, it is a one-two punch here for some of these places. 
Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think Bill just mentioned that Knoxville, we're supposed to get another wintry precipitation, wintry mix tomorrow night into Friday morning. So yeah, we have several inches on the ground right now, but then of course we'll be adding about a half uh, an inch or more possibly when that other system comes through. But Hallie, you mentioned here in the South, we're not used to seeing stuff like this. Um, 8.6 inches in a matter of days, but typically in Knoxville specifically, the entire winter season and probably gets about four inches of snow. Um, so yeah, it caught a lot of people off guard. Take a listen. I don't remember it being this much snow, staying this this long for 10 years or more probably. Yeah. I wasn't expecting this much, mm -hmm. especially to see it fall down for so long, yeah. you know? So, and then the cold temperatures staying the way they are. And Hallie, obviously, because of these conditions, the cold, the snow that remains on the ground right now, schools are closed pretty much across the state for the entire week um, as they continue to kind of the, the cleanup process. A lot of uh, workers are also encouraged to work from home, work remotely. But you mentioned earlier the, the power system, the power grid is also taking a big hit because so many people are inside cranking up that heat. So officials are also encouraging people to kind of conserve power if possible. Hallie, Kathy Park, live first there in Knoxville, Tennessee. Kathy, thank you. Take you out east now to New York, further east and north, I should say, because things are getting kind of testy both inside and outside a courtroom in Manhattan with former President Trump in just the last hour saying in one of his properties that he never had anything to do with writer E. Jean Carroll after day two of that defamation trial wrapped up in the last hour or so. Listen. I have no idea until this happened, obviously. I have no idea who she was and nor could I care less. It's a rigged deal. It's a made-up, fabricated story. That's after, again, the defamation damages trial, we should say. That's after the judge in the case started to get kind of fed up with the former president and his attorney, at one point telling them, hey, we're going to do it my way in the courtroom. The trial puts former President Trump and Carol face-to-face -face today. She got on the stand to tell the jury how Mr. Trump, in her words, ended the world she'd been living in when he called her a liar. Now, remember here, no matter how much Mr. Trump denies everything Carol's saying on the stand, he has already been found liable for sexually abusing and defaming her. This trial is only about how much money he now needs to pay as a consequence. The trial happening less than a week now, six days ahead of the New Hampshire primary, where a new poll out tonight shows him leading by double digits as he's taking aim at his competitor, Nikki Haley. He is mocking her, mocking her birth name. He is attacking her in a variety of ways. We'll get to more on that in a second with Garrett Haight, who's in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Dasha Burns is also on the campaign trail in Manchester. But let me start with Rahema Ellis to talk about that trial from New York. It is not just his uh, political competitors he's attacking. It is also the judge in this trial, Rahema, as we've seen in just the last hour or so. Talk us through it. Well, it has been a back and forth between Donald Trump and the judge, as well as the judge and uh, Donald Trump's attorney, Alina Abba, as she was attempting to make uh, the case for Donald Trump. It got so heated, in fact. Now, this is when the, the jury was out of the courtroom, but the judge had been making clear that he did not want any statements to be made that were disparaging that could be within the earshot of the jurors. Well, the president, as you pointed out, he was he was mumbling. He was making remarks. There were uh, times that things that were being said, according to the attorney for E. Jean Carroll, that just were inappropriate. So at some point, take a look at this. The judge said to Mr. Trump, I hope I don't have to consider excluding you from the trial. I understand you were very eager for me to do that. And Trump responded, I would love it. I would love it. And Judge Lewis Kaplan says, I know you would because you just can't control yourself in this circumstance. You just can't. And then Trump was reportedly heard muttering later, you can't either in terms of referring to the judge. It is an interesting back and forth. And all of this, as you point out, is about trying to stop Trump from making disparaging remarks about E. Jean Carroll, which... Uh, he keeps saying that he doesn't know who she is. Uh, on his Truth Social social media post, he said this, I did nothing wrong except defend myself from false, malicious, and defamatory accusations by somebody writing a book and deciding to put this fake nonsense into it, probably for the publicity she, she would get. 
Uh, that's also the kind of thing that his attorney was attempting to elicit from E. Jean Carroll on cross-examination. She was asking her about, well, why did you go on television and do interviews? Why did you do newspaper interviews if you were so afraid uh, for your safety and if there were so many uh, threats, death threats, et cetera, threats of harm to you and even threats of rape to you? Uh, she went on to say that as an 80-year-old woman, she felt that she needed to speak out about what had happened to her and that she was not going to be silenced. Uh, she had a right to say what was on her mind and to tell what had happened to her because it had gone on for too long. Hallie? Rahima Ellis, live for us there in New York. Rahima, lots to cover on that front. Thank you, Garrett. Let me bring you in now because there is obviously a political component to this as well. He, he is going, the former president, from court to the campaign trail to the room where you are now, six days to the New Hampshire primary. Um, we know and we have seen in the numbers that his legal issues actually mobilize his supporters, his loyal supporters. That seems to be the dynamic right now in the primary. Question is, what happens in a general? Yeah, and I think it's going to remain an open question until we get that far, Hallie. Although yeah. I will say, just from my conversations, non-scientific with Trump supporters, I think there sort of are two different schools of thought. There are Trump supporters like the kind of folks who wait for hours to come to rallies like this one, for whom he can do no wrong, and even a conviction in one of these cases. Uh, I'm thinking like the election interference case or the classified documents case, more so than the one we're talking about today. For them, that would mean absolutely nothing. But, you know, I interviewed two Trump-supporting uh, gentlemen today here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, who both told me that if he was convicted of something, they would think twice about this, that that's a different mm. set of facts than what they feel like are political prosecutions, political investigations up to that point. And Trump himself seems kind of broadly aware of that dynamic when he talks about even the makeup of the electorate here in New Hampshire, like he did a short time ago. Listen to what he said about this race. I think we'll do there, maybe similar to what we did in Iowa. Uh, the difference is that in New Hampshire, they allow Democrats to vote for whatever reason in the Republican primary, and they also let uh, independents vote in the Republican primary. So that is a big difference. Hallie, the funny thing about general elections is they let Democrats and independents vote in those, too. And I think you hear Donald Trump kind of grappling with the changing electorates that he might face, not just this Tuesday, but in November when he when or if he becomes the nominee again. Yeah, that's right. And to the point that you're making, independents can also vote in New Hampshire in the primary there. And some new polling out in just the last couple of minutes has some interesting dynamics here, specifically when you get into undeclared mm -hmm. voters in the in in this. Nikki Haley is leading former President Trump there by double digits. But here's the thing, Garrett. She would have to be to try to do as well in New Hampshire as she wants to. Like, if those numbers were inverted, that would be a huge warning sign for Nikki Haley. The question is, is where independence will go from her, as well as that sort of sector that people call never Trumpers in New Hampshire as well. Right, and, and this becomes part of the problem. And if we can nerd out on poll data for a minute here, Do if you it. look at further into once. that same poll, <laughs> as much, where she leads him on undeclared voters, his lead is twice hers among Republicans, self-identified Republicans in that same poll. And so this is always the challenge with a poll of the New Hampshire primary, is figuring out exactly how big the universe of undeclared yeah. or independent voters will be. Is it 30% of the people who turn out? Is it 60% of the people who turn out? There are different models and different theories of that case and in that question may lay the answer of exactly how close this race is between Nikki Haley and Donald Trump in this state. But whatever that number is, it tells you the problem that Nikki Haley could face beyond New Hampshire when you get to states like South Carolina, when you look at the caucus in Nevada, which is a party run exercise there, all of a sudden you're dealing with that pure Republican electorate again and the numbers shift back in Donald Trump's favor. So it could be a mirage, it could be an opportunity for Nikki Haley. The beauty of all this is we don't have to wait long to find out, Hallie. Voters will be voting not too long from now. Garrett, thank you very much. Dasha Burns is also following, by the way, the other candidate who is still in this race, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, although he is not still in, he, he's not going to be committing to New Hampshire, I should say. He is really putting a lot of his eggs in the South Carolina basket here. He had invested a ton in Iowa. That was a state where he thought he was going to do very well. He came out in that second place finish there, distant, of course, second to Donald Trump. What's the vibe in South Carolina? What advantages do they see in making that move? Why is that happening? Well, because New Hampshire is just not his state. As Garrett just laid out there, because of this large number of independents, these moderate voters, this is not the voter base that Ron DeSantis does well in. 
South Carolina is a different story. It is Trump country, but throughout this race, that's exactly where he has sort of tried to pivot. He's tried to chip away at that Trump base with his more conservative messaging. And so he feels that that is where he could not necessarily outmatch Trump, but where he could outmatch Nikki Haley. And they like the timeline that they see here, uh, the month that they will have between the New Hampshire primary and the South Carolina primary to really uh, get their ducks in a row there, to rally support on the ground, to uh, create an operation similar to what they did in Iowa. Of course, they don't have the full uh, amount of time there, but they do have a good amount of lead time to, to try to get their boots on the ground and, and do some serious work in South Carolina where they think they could turn this thing into a two-person race because that's Nikki Haley's home turf, and they think if you can't win your home state, that's going to be difficult to uh, to surpass, right? How do you keep uh, moving forward if you lose your home state? The advantage for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is that Florida is a little bit later on in the primary timeline. So he's not doing so hot in that state, but he's got a little bit of ways to go before he gets uh, to cross that bridge, Hallie. Dasha Burns live for us there in Manchester. Dasha, thank you so much. We'll talk again soon. I know. Let's bring it back here to Washington where President Biden in just the last maybe 90 minutes or so is wrapping up a pretty key meeting with some of the top leaders on Capitol Hill. He wants more money for Israel, for Ukraine, for border security, according to what multiple sources tell NBC News. We're actually just getting the readout here, too, which is readout DC speak for, like, the debrief on how the meeting went. And in it, uh, the White House says that President Biden underscored the importance of Congress making sure that Ukraine gets the resources it needs. Separately, parallel track, there's also this potential for a government shutdown on Friday. Should you be freaking out about that? No. Probably not. We're going to talk about why in just a second with Kelly O'Donnell, who is live for us, uh, I, I believe, outside the White House. Uh, yes, outside the White House, Kelly. I never know. North Lawn, you know, <laughs> a little bit further. Um, Kelly, let me, let me start. Exactly. Let me start here on the, the piece of things that were discussed at the meeting, which it sounds like really focused on this issue of border security, with this issue of uh, this funding bill sort of more broadly that the president wants to get done. Talk us through what we know. Well, the focus on what was most important in the meeting also depended on which party uh, of leaders yes. came to the table, right? So for President Biden and the Democrats, his focus was on the necessity, in his view, that Ukraine has to be funded, that that is a risk to NATO and our alliances there, and an opening for Russia if the United States does not maintain its support. As you know, Republicans, especially those from the House side coming to this meeting, really want to talk about the border and then get to some of the other issues. So that's part of it. But the meeting itself is noteworthy, Hallie, because we haven't seen many occasions where the president and now Speaker Johnson have been in the same room. We've not seen any visuals of that yet either. Uh, but they were meeting. But it went beyond the four leaders of both parties in both chambers to also include top uh, cap. Uh, uh, committee representatives, the mm -hmm. chair or the, the ranking of the specialty areas, so intelligence and foreign relations, is, uh, foreign relations and so forth. Plus, from the administration side, some of the intel people. So the intention from the White House was to provide some insight in a classified way and non-classified about what they believe Ukraine needs. For Speaker Johnson, he is saying he is willing to listen to those things, that there are uh, issues they can deal with. But unless or until there is action on the border. We also understand that the president is indicating that he, too, believes there needs to be uh, work done to, they call it the challenges at the border, but there's an acknowledgement that there needs to be work done here. So the Friday deadline you, you correctly yeah. referenced is one of those where uh, there is a plan to get the budget uh, for another month or so, uh, and all the systems seem to be that that would likely extend. The harder issues today were on these big thematic uh, concerns. How do they really try to reach a new policy on the border and the funding that goes with it? And what is the appetite for extending U.S. commitment in Ukraine? Allie? I'm so curious, Kelly, and you referenced this, that we really haven't seen President Biden and Speaker Johnson face-to-face -face a ton since Johnson took that speaker's gavel uh, at the end of last year. The, the relationship between a president and a speaker of the House matters, right? We, we saw it just in the last administration between former President Trump and then Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, at, at a low point, of course. What, do we know anything about the dynamics between these two here? Because it will be telling, not just in an election year, but, of course, uh, moving forward. 
For, for policy, not just politics, I should yes, say. Yes, we don't. And clearly there's always politics there. But there are yeah. also both constitutional officers who have to keep the government going and find ways <laughs> uh, to work together. So we have not seen, and when I say that, I mean there are no public images of the president and Speaker Johnson together. There was not coverage of this meeting today. There is not coverage of every meeting, but certainly important meetings. Uh, yeah. There's a newsworthiness there, and so we have yet to see that. Speaker Johnson and others were invited to come out to the cameras uh, on the, on the, outside the West Wing, as you know, at the stakeout location, and he did make some comments, and now lawmakers are continuing to talk back on Capitol Hill, and the White House is giving us information through the readout, uh, as you pointed out, which is sort of a, a, a nice way of describing the themes of uh, the meeting, meaning they put it in the best possible context and the best possible emphasis from their point of view. So uh, the relationship matters, and can they go forward and actually get something done now is one of those points of being tested. You will let us know, Kelly O'Donnell, I know. Thank you, friend. Good to see you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Still ahead here on the show. A lot more to get to from overseas because you've probably already heard about these health scares for the royal family. We'll tell you what we know, what little we know about why Princess Kate is not expected to be in the public eye until after Easter and the procedure just scheduled for her father-in-law, the king. Plus, members only, the new system Costco's testing out to try to crack down on card sharing. Tonight, the Princess of Wales is in the hospital, recovering from what Kensington Palace says was a successful abdominal surgery. Excuse me, abdominal surgery. That's all we know. Abdominal surgery. That's really all they're saying about this, other than she's going to be taking a break, kind of laying low, taking it easy for the next couple of months. That's after she'll be in the hospital for an estimated two weeks. So maybe 13 more days from today. No reason why. That's it. That's really all they said, is the princess has asked for privacy. News of her hospitalization news that rocketed around the world today came just before we learned that her father-in-law, King Charles III, is having a procedure next week to treat an enlarged prostate. Megan Fitzgerald is joining us now. A lot coming out of the royal family here related to health issues, related to hospitalizations. Let's start here with, with what's happening with Princess Kate, of course, uh, who's, who's married to Prince William. Long road to recovery, it sounds like. Two weeks in the hospital, a couple of months of laying low, taking it easy after that. Do we have any insight as to what the medical concern is here? We know that she's asked for privacy, obviously. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And look, Kensington Palace is not releasing much detail, but you're absolutely right to, to ask that question because, I mean, given the length of recovery, it certainly makes it seem as though uh, this was a significant surgery that she underwent yesterday. Now, of course, Kensington Palace saying that this was a planned procedure, a planned operation, uh, and that it was non-cancerous uh, and that it was successful. So certainly some good news there, but it, it certainly doesn't negate the fact that she's going to be spending at least the next uh, two weeks behind me in the hospital here recovering. Once she is released, she will then continue recuperating at home uh, for at least the next several months. I mean, medical officials are advising, according to Kensington Palace, uh, that the Princess of Wales doesn't get back to work. No public appearances until after Easter. So that's, you know, a, a pretty long way away. Uh, and then also keep in mind the fact that she's not done any public appearances since the beginning of this year. The last time we saw her, Hallie, uh, was on Christmas. Then there's King Charles, and this news coming out the same day, right, the same evening there where you are also set to take a break while he recovers from this procedure here. What do we know about that and anything on the timing of these announcements, both coming on the same day? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, so what Buckingham Palace has told us earlier today is that uh, King Charles is going to be going for treatment for an enlarged prostate next week. Uh, we know that this his condition is benign. Uh, they also say that the recuperation is going to be a short time. So no more details than that. Um, but they also are, are saying that the reason why the king wanted to be so detailed, descriptive, and, and go so public with this, uh, he's trying to send a message here. He wants uh, men all across the world uh, to sort of Take a look at themselves. If you if you feel something, uh, if something just doesn't seem right, to go and get it checked. He's trying to send that message. But then rightfully, as you pointed out, Hallie, I mean, look, this is not typically what we see coming from Buckingham Palace. We don't see this level of transparency, if you will. Right. Um, they're, they're not as public. They're very private about their condition, certainly as it relates to health. This is what we saw with the Queen. We've talked to royal experts about this, and they say, look, 
it's likely lessons learned from the past. This idea that, you know, the more transparent you are, you're controlling the message, you're releasing factual information, it sort of limits or at least pushes away um, the amount of rumors that could swirl, Hallie. Megan Fitzgerald, live for us there in London, likely to be a, a busy few weeks for you all over there. Thank you so much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a Missouri man who spent nearly 30 years in prison after getting wrongfully convicted is filing a lawsuit today against the city of St. Louis and multiple police officers. Lamar Johnson alleges officers framed him for a murder he did not commit. He's seeking damages unspecified. You might remember this story. We told you about it over the course of the last couple of years as I've traveled to St. Louis and talked to Johnson. He spent decades in prison even though two other people confessed to the crime. Missouri law only allowed motions for new trials within like two weeks of a conviction. He told me last year he wants to help others moving forward, others that have also been wrongfully convicted, going through the same thing he went through. Number two, Sheryl Sandberg announcing in a Facebook post today she is leaving Meta's board of directors. This is just coming into us actually in the last couple of minutes here. She says she's going to continue as an advisor to the company, but remember, she was kind of OG at Meta back when it was Facebook. She stepped down from her role as COO back in 2022 after a number of controversies at Meta, like the fight over disinformation and hate on their platforms and antitrust investigations. Number three, colorectal cancer is now the deadliest cancer for men under 50, according to the American Cancer Society. And it is the second deadliest cancer among women in the same age group, behind breast cancer. Doctors aren't sure why colorectal cancer is becoming more common, but they say that people may be less active, eating less healthy, that could be part of it. Number four, heads up to Costco shoppers. If you're sharing your membership cards, a crackdown is coming. They're launching a pilot program where employees scan your cards instead of you just like flashing them at people at the door. Costco says the new system should speed up the shopping process. Number five, the New England Patriots are formally introducing their new head coach today, Jared Mayo. He is 37 years old, youngest head coach in the NFL. He'll also be the first black head coach in Patriots history. Some newly released body cam video tonight shows the dramatic moment police raided a home in Ohio, serving a warrant for a person who might not live there anymore and raising questions about why officers were there in the first place. We're going to show you the video with a warning that it may be disturbing. Police search warrant, come to the door! Police search warrant, come to the door! Dogs, dogs, dogs! Police search warrant! Coming down the stairs! You heard it there, glass shattering, a woman screaming as police force their way through the door. The woman says her baby is there, a baby who has a pre-existing condition. He's on a ventilator. The 17-month-old was hospitalized the next day as the mom blames police negligence. The mayor has ordered an investigation. Valerie Castro is joining us now. Valerie, we have some conflicting reports here, particularly surrounding the care of the baby. Mm -hmm. What do we know about what happened and what are police saying? So, Hallie, from the get-go, Courtney Price, who is the mother of the baby, she is telling police, look, my baby is on a ventilator inside this home. There is body camera footage later on after she's brought out of the house in handcuffs, again telling police that her child is inside the home and on a ventilator. Later, body camera footage again shows everyone inside the home. They are now looking at this baby, assessing the baby, including the mom, and police released a statement saying that detectives, paramedics, and mom were inside the home. They confirmed that the child did not sustain any apparent visible injuries. Now, mom says she was still worried. They went to the hospital and then the hospital released them. But the next day, she says her baby's not breathing. She calls 911. Again, they go to a hospital. That's when her child is transported to a children's hospital. And she says doctors there tell her that her son is suffering from inflammation to his lungs and irritation around his eyes that they believe could be caused by some sort of chemical reaction. Now, police issued a statement saying that they did use those flashbangs when they entered the home. They say those were only sound and light. They say there was no chemical component to those flashbangs. So in another portion of the statement, they say any allegations suggesting the child was exposed to chemical agents, lack of medical attention, or negligence is not true. But Hallie, Courtney Price uh, doesn't seem to think that's the case. Do we know why police were even at this house in the first place? 
So the city of Elyria released some police reports and some documents after this all happened, and police say this was an investigation around some stolen firearms. They had a search warrant. They were looking for someone, and that is why they were at that particular home. Price says the person that they were looking for, she got a look at the search warrants. She says the person they were looking for hasn't lived there in more than a year. She says now her aunt and uncle live there. She just moved there last week to stay with them while her baby waits uh, for heart surgery. Again, he's a preemie. And she says uh, he needs that surgery. So that's why she was there in the first place. But as far as she knows, the suspect hasn't been there in quite some time. Valerie Castro, thank you very much. Coming up, fireworks factory explodes in Thailand. Where do you see some of the video here? The new questions now ahead in the global. Plus, what we're just learning about another potential escalation off the coast of Yemen. What we now know about a new drone strike targeting a U.S. ship. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our international teams have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Zambia, more than 400 people are dead from a cholera outbreak that is just ripping through the country. Schools are now going to close as cases hit above the 10,000 mark. The government there says it's launching, launching a huge mass vaccine program. They're spending nearly two and a half million, they're sending, excuse me, nearly two and a half million liters of water to communities that have been affected. The UN says this is part of a recent string of outbreaks across Southern African countries since the start of last year. In Thailand, at least 20 people have been killed after an explosion at a fireworks factory. You are looking at, that's the factory. But what it used to be, I mean, that's what's left of it, I should say. Rescue workers say nobody survived, just horrific. No word yet on what caused it. And out of the UK, the House of Commons is passing the Prime Minister's controversial bill to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. Right-wingers and his Conservative Party demanded more moves to address illegal immigration, while the opposition says the bill violates human rights laws. Still, it's not passing without some embarrassment for Sunak. Two of his top party allies resigned over this whole thing. It still faces one more hurdle to become law. Listen, we've got some other breaking news just into us now. A U.S. ship hit by a drone strike in the Gulf of Aden today. The latest attack in the seas in the Middle East with Yemeni armed forces claiming responsibility. This comes right after the U.S. declared the Houthis, based in Yemen, a terror group. The latest thing to try to stop all of those Houthi drone and missile attacks on military ships and commercial ships in the Red Sea. But the Houthis are not backing down, saying they're going to keep fighting with the top leader, saying in, in a new statement to the U.S., you can call us whatever you want. Remember, the U.S. and allies are also hitting the Houthis with strikes in Yemen over all this. That new terror label that'll take effect in 30 days brings along financial sanctions and penalties for the Houthis that the White House says they're designing to try and limit how much this harms civilians in Yemen, who are among the world's poorest and hungriest. Elsewhere in the region, of course, that war between Israel and Hamas continues. With inside Gaza, much-needed medicine set to be delivered to hostages in exchange for more humanitarian aid. Richard Engel has more from Jerusalem. The crisis in the Red Sea continues to escalate. A short while ago, the Houthi militia, which controls large parts of Yemen, which has already been targeted by the U.S. military on at least three occasions, said that it carried out another attack on an American vessel. No confirmation of that strike. Uh, in the statement from the Yemeni military, that's how the Houthis describe themselves, they said that they fully expect there to be another American retaliation, but that they will not be deterred. Uh, they have already been designated just today as an official terrorist organization. And that comes with consequences, making it more difficult for international humanitarian organizations to operate inside Yemen, making it uh, more difficult for uh, Houthi uh, officials to travel, engage in any kind of international finance. Uh, earlier, I spoke with one of the very top Houthi leaders, and he said that despite the terrorist uh, designation, they had been on the U.S. U.S. terrorist list, then taken off of it, and now put back onto it again. Uh, they said that they will continue to carry out attacks in the Red Sea. They said that they are targeting vessels that are bound for Israel or assisting Israel in its war against Hamas in Gaza, but that other ships uh, are free to transit through the Red Sea and will not be targeted at all. That is something that is disputed by the Biden administration. Uh, in the war, uh, ongoing war between Israel and Hamas, 
Hamas that has left uh, so much destruction and created so much suffering for the for the people of Gaza. A deal has been reached and is now in the early stages of being implemented between Israel and Hamas, brokered by Qatar, uh, involving France, to get medicines to the hostages. There are at least, uh, Israel believes, a hundred hostages still alive in Gaza, held by Hamas and, and other militant groups. And when these hostages were kidnapped, some of them were injured, some of them are elderly. Uh, by now, they are many badly need medication. So the Israeli government provided the intermediaries detailed lists of the uh, medications that they require. The medications came from Fla France, flown to Egypt. They're being inspected uh, now and will be transferred from an Israeli uh, crossing point into Gaza. Um, for every single box of, of medicine going to the hostages, according to the deal, 1,000 are to be delivered to the Palestinian people. The inspections are, are underway. It is a slow process, and it is, and it is hoped to be in full swing uh, by tomorrow morning local time. Our thanks to Richard Engel for that reporting. we got a lot more to get to coming up, including some new moves from the FAA tonight after that scary explosion, that scary door blowout, basically, in midair, how the agency is now expanding its investigation into Boeing. Plus, e-bike battery fires. We are seeing more of them across the country, with officials warning that number may not go down anytime soon. The FAA is announcing today it's finished the first 40 inspections of those 737 MAX 9 planes. They're looking at the data, then they're going to look at the rest of the fleet. Remember, MAX 9s are grounded. They are not flying right now because of that, that gaping hole in the middle of that Alaska Airlines flight. Remember that about a week and a half ago? That's because that door plug you see on the ground blew out of the plane. It basically popped out of the plane's body, fell down to the ground. That's why all 737 MAX 9 planes are grounded in this country. Now, the FAA says today they're paying special attention to the subcontractor that makes and installs these so-called plug doors, just as we're learning exactly where that part was made. Officials aren't saying when they think the MAX 9s are going to be ready to fly again. I want to bring in Tom Costello now. This obviously affects United. This obviously affects Alaska, which fly those MAX 9 planes. Yep. Um, talk about the timeline to try to get those planes back in the air. Do we have any idea? There is no timeline right now. I, I think the answer is when they are ready to fly, when the FAA feels they're ready to fly, and the MAX 9 it remains grounded. And the FAA is upset at Boeing and is not in any rush to do Boeing any favors whatsoever. The FAA feels duped, if you will. They feel like they've given uh, Boeing plenty of opportunities to clean up their act since the MAX 8 crashes that killed so many people. Then we've had this very serious incident. It could have been fatal, and there's not a lot of goodwill. Let me also draw your attention to what the airlines, the uh, Alaska Airlines CEO said today, because they also have been very concerned about safety. They're put. This is astonishing. Alaska is putting their own inspectors into the Boeing plant to double check Boeing's work wow. because they don't believe Boeing anymore. I mean, that's astonishing. That's with the FAA doing the same thing. So here's the CEO of Alaska Airlines today talking to passengers. Since Alaska Airlines and the FAA have grounded these aircraft, that means we are canceling between 110 to 150 flights every day. We will return these aircraft to service only when all findings have been fully resolved and meet the stringent standards of Boeing, the FAA, and Alaska Airlines. Bottom line is that's costing these airlines money, right? If you can't fly the planes that you buy to carry passengers, uh, these planes are sitting empty. They've got to cancel flights. This is impacting them as well. So you now have got Boeing under pressure from a lot of different fronts, from the government, from its customers here. What do they say? Uh, first of all, this is the, I would call this the most serious reputational harm that's been done to Boeing maybe ever. I mean, yeah. I think it's even more than the Max 8 because it's on top of the Max 8, right? After they promised they'd do better. And, oh, by the way, there's Spirit Aerosystems, which actually designs that's the, the fuselage. That's correct. Yeah. They are the ones who produce the fuselage with that door plug. And the NTSB chief told me today, in fact, that was made in Malaysia by Spirit Aerosystems, a subsidiary in Malaysia. All right, so Boeing CEO went to Spirit today in Wichita to talk to the entire workforce, and here's what he said. Let me just draw your attention to the last three sentences there. He says that we're essentially, in every way, we are going to learn from it, the event, and then, it's, he says, we're going to apply it to literally everything else 
we do. Make no mistake about it. He is trying to send a message to the spirit team. We are all one team, but you guys messed up in a big way. You've damaged your credibility. You've damaged our credibility. We've got the FAA on us like a ton of bricks. We've got Congress. We've got the media, NBC News all over this story. You got lawsuits. This is exactly what they did not need, and it is very serious. Do you see a broader domino effect in the supply chain at all because of this? Well, I think that there are serious questions, and these have been raised for a long time, by the way, in the Wall Street Journal, the Seattle Times, the New York Times, about the supply chain that Boeing has turned to. They want to streamline everything, cut costs. They often turn to the cheapest supplier they can to cut costs. Uh, and whether this has been a, a, a good tactic. Listen, Spirit has had many problems over the years. They've drilled a whole bunch of holes in the fuselage that were un, you know, not even needed. So the pressure now was on Spirit, and then ultimately Boeing's responsible. This is a Boeing product. Tom Costello, we're so glad to have you on top of the story. And we are so glad, by the way, thank you for the last couple of days. As I've been in the field, we love seeing you here on the show. Oh, you kidding me? Thank this was nice and warm and cozy. I, Did I you was, get your coffee yet? I was very jealous. Thank you. Tom <laughs> okay. Costello, appreciate you. This is tonight's original now. It's some in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And listen, you've probably seen some videos like this one, right? E-bike batteries bursting into flames. The aftermath here, you see... Some of those fires have been deadly, and officials say they're now going to try to do something about it. They've been trying, but this week, you've got people from all across the country here in Washington to push for more regulations on e-bike batteries. They've seen more of these fires, more than 260 in New York City last year alone, according to fire officials. Jake Ward takes a closer look. In New York City's Chinatown, a raging fire killing four people. I step out, I see the e-bike store, it's on fire. The cause, lithium-ion batteries used to power e-bikes, setting this building, housing a bike shop, on fire, according to the New York City Fire Department. The sheer volume of fire is incredibly dangerous. Months later, e-bike batteries igniting another fire in a Bronx apartment, killing a 93-year-old woman and hurting nine others. Fire officials say they found an e-bike near the door. And this month, New York's Fire Department releasing this video, saying it took just 2.5 minutes for a fire from an exploding battery to consume another e-bike shop. It's a rising issue in New York City, where some 65,000 e-bikes zoom through the streets, the transportation of choice for many delivery workers. Firefighters responding to 267 e-bike battery fires last year, up from just 30 in 2019. And deaths from e-bike fires tripled from 6 in 2022 to 18 in 2023, according to FDNY data. And it's not just a New York problem. Fires from California to Florida, alarming officials and sparking regulations. A U.S. electronic safety company says those e-bike fires are probably a result of cheaply made batteries that might not comply with U.S. standards. These app companies have caused the demand for deliveries and particularly fast deliveries to go up along with, you know, a very cheap supply of these from overseas that are not manufactured appropriately or safely. The FDNY commissioner spoke to us from Washington, D.C., where she is pushing lawmakers to join New York City in banning uncertified lithium-ion batteries. So if these batteries can't get here, they really can't be sold within the city or the state. So we want to see the federal government, uh, you know, mimic what we did in New York City. The city is also looking for other solutions, like fast-charging bike docks, battery swapping, and an e-bike trade-in program. But advocates for delivery workers say it is just the beginning of what's needed to make e-bikes and the people riding them safer. What we want to see is all the state and the federal government to step up, to think about how we can expand these type of programs for other New Yorkers. Jake Ward is joining us now. Jake, we're so glad to see you. And I have to sort of disclose here, as an avid e-biker myself, I'm super interested in this. And I think a lot of people are. We've seen e-bikes, as you point out, explode in popularity. But it's not just the bikes. These batteries are in, you know, like a lot of things, right? That's absolutely correct. You know, and Hallie, what we're looking at is a technology that is in many cases far out in front of the solutions that we need to put fires out when they take place. We've seen this in, you know, Tesla vehicles and other electric vehicles mm -hmm. where once they catch fire, you know, in some European cities, they've had to deploy special tractor trailers filled with a special fluid, basically lift the burning vehicle into the air and drop it into this. The amount of water you have to put on one of these things when they catch fire is incredible. And that's true even down to the scale of something like an e-bike. Now, 
now. The e-bike that you own, Hallie, and that presumably those watching would own, you know, fall under the kind of regulations that we would expect. They meet a certain certification, all of that. The problem here, and this is something that both Grubhub, Uber, DoorDash, all say they're wor working on is this idea that we need to make a law that makes it possible that people get paid enough to actually own the right kind of e-bike the way you and I do, and that laws are passed to, to ban the flow of uncertified batteries into the mm -hmm. country alley. Jake Ward, thank you so much for bringing us tonight's original. Appreciate it. Still to come here on the show, how each of the 2024 candidates says they plan to handle the economy, the biggest issue that matters to people, their money, right, with a new warning now from the head of the nation's biggest bank. A little bit of a yellow flag today on the economy from one of the world's most powerful bankers, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase. He's telling our friends over at CNBC that he still feels cautious, cautious, that's his word, about the state of the economy. Here's why. He cites Russia's war in Ukraine, unrest across the Middle East. We talked about that earlier in the show. And then some question marks over what the Fed may do on inflation and interest rates. All of it coming together in an election year where Americans are split along party lines about whether the um, economy or democracy is a bigger issue for the next president. Here's what we do know, however, that despite the numbers, whatever the numbers say, the vibes, people are not vibing with where the economy is. Another new poll shows half of Americans already think that we are in a recession or a depression here, right? 46%, nearly half there. The country is not actually in a recession or a depression at the moment. Christine Romans joins us now. But Christine, people kind of feel that way, right? This is one of the big challenges for President Biden heading into November here. Yeah. He's going to face a Republican candidate who's going to be framing the economy in a very different way from President Biden here, right? Walk us through what the vision is from some of these Republicans and from the president himself. Sure. And let's just be, be very clear here. The U.S. economy is not in a recession, That's nowhere right. near it. But there is a vibe session, as you point out. People just are not feeling it. So that's where we start this campaign season. And you have Joe Biden, who has embraced Bidenomics, of course. Uh, look, he wants to maintain the Federal Reserve's independence. He wants to keep some of those tax cuts from 2017. Um, from the, the Trump tax cuts, but he wants to raise taxes on, on rich people and some companies. And he says he will not touch uh, Social Security. And that, I think, is going to be the third rail of American politics. I think mm -hmm. you're going to be hearing an awful lot more about that uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was just speaking with a, a, a voter. She is in her 80s in New Hampshire. She's a longtime Republican, but she was, let me tell you, Social Security, huge issue for yeah, yeah. her. That was a big one. Um, are there, go, go through some of the Republicans, sure. Christine, if you can, of where so, they stand. Donald Trump also says he will not touch um, Social Security. He even stepped forward when there were some arguments in Congress recently where do not touch Social Security. So that's off the table for him and, and, and the party that he wants to lead here. On taxes, he wants more tax cuts like he had in 2017. And he won't say it, but he has pressured the Fed as president in the past. So you could see the Fed, which is an independent agency, of course, uh, coming into, you know, uh, under pressure from him if he were president again. Nikki Haley, she also says she would pressure the, the, the Federal Reserve. She wants it to focus more on the stability of the dollar. She wants more tax cuts. And she is suggested she eliminates, she would like to eliminate the salt, that state and local tax deduction completely. She says it favors the rich. And on Social Security, she's a little more thoughtful than some of those candidates who say they would do nothing. Thing. She has uh, floated raising the retirement age for very young people. At some point, you know, the, the, just the numbers don't work out. And this right. is where Ron DeSantis is, right? Putting pressure on the Federal Reserve, I think you can expect that. Um, he wants to abolish the IRS completely and have a flat tax. Uh, and when he was running for Congress, he said that he would privatize Social Security and raise the retirement age, although he's not saying that today. When do you think, Christine, as you, and thank you for that, because that's a super clear sort of look at some of the big issues for people uh, economy-wise. Let's go back to the vibe session thing. Right. When might the vibes match the numbers? Like, what's, what's the sense of things? Because unemployment is low, inflation yep. is slowing down, wages are up. Like, what's, what's, what, is the, what is the disconnect? So it's starting to happen now. We had a University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index that um, was, was improving, quite frankly. You had retail sales this week that were strong, so people are still spending. So one after another, we're starting to see that loosen up just a little bit as inflation has come down from its record highs. So that Michigan number, you can see improving there. And then mm. overall, it really depends, too, on what your politics are. Republicans under a Democratic president tend to feel a lot worse about things than Democrats do at the moment. So there's also a partisanship thing that you can see happening here uh, based on who's in office. 
Christine Romans. Thank you so much. Great I to really see appreciate you. you being on for the breakdown tonight. Good to see you too. <laughs> that does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.